Good morning. We're uh, really glad you all came out today. We appreciate everybody that's here. We know you've got all kinds of options and such, and we're thankful that you decided to spend the morning with us out here. And hopefully, hopefully you're learning something. I know in the side conversations I've been having with a lot of producers, I'm learning a few things myself as well, and I, I find that to be very, very enjoyable. And, and folks, you heard the announcement this morning about uh, Farm Bureau's commitment to the Grain and Forage Center of Excellence, and we're so appreciative to that. We're appreciative to the farmers. Uh, to the organizations that that got the ball even rolling with the Grain and Forage Center of Excellence. Uh, we really, really value our relationships and our commitments to uh, the people in Kentucky and in this region. And so uh, we, we're just very humbled and appreciative of that as well. So it's an exciting day for us to, to get to announce that at a field day. All right, so my talk is the simple practices for high yield corn, and that's kind of an offensive title because if it was simple, we'd get high yield corn all the time, right? So keep that, keep that in mind as we go through this. But what I'm gonna talk about today is I'm gonna to try to hit some of the highlights of, we've been doing research for several years and we've been getting yields above 300 bushels per acre for several yield, years. We're fairly consistent at it. Now that I've said that, we won't get it this year, but we've been fairly consistent at getting there. And so what I wanted to do was hit some highlights of at least in our research, what has gotten us over that threshold, okay? So this isn't necessarily a talk about what you've got to do in your operation, but how many folks have read a farm magazine recently about how to get high yield corn? Is there more than one opinion in there? I mean, every other page you can flip through and find a different thing that you're supposed to do to get high yield corn. And so I thought we would do this topic to sort of distill down what are some of the things that have been working for us in some of these different studies we've done. Now, a lot of these studies we've done have been funded by the Kentucky Corn Grower Association. Some of the studies have been funded by industry, by some of the seed companies and some of the fertilizer companies. Uh, we couldn't do the research without those kind of fundings. What you can see in this image right here, does anything look different about this corn right here in this image to any of you? Besides the center pivot. Do the rows look more narrow or narrower? Maybe a little bit. Okay, so these are 15 inch rows. And some of these plots in here are 60,000 plants per acre. So there's some of the differences that we're looking at in here. So we'll, we'll get into some of that here in a moment. All right, before we talk about what gives us high yield, let's talk a little bit about what prevented it. Now, this is a short list. That list can, is a whole lot longer than this right here that we've, we've got for you. But one of the big ones is shallow roots. I've got a picture, in this case, of a root that's a 2D root. That means it's only going in basically one direction instead of spanning out in three dimensional, all different directions. It's been, it's been confined to the seed furrow. And I'll tell you right now, if you see that early in the season, your odds of getting high yield corn is not very good. At that point, you have taken a pretty decent, decent yield hit in your operation. Poor stands, whether, whether we've, we've uh, tried to plant the right population and we had something else that reduced our stands, or we just simply didn't have enough corn out there Either one of those have been an issue in some of what we've done. Southern rust. Southern rust got us last year in some of our studies. Uh, we probably should have put an application out that we didn't put out at the right time in one of our studies last year that got us. You heard a lot about southern rust in the last session, right? Carl, he, he covered all that with you. That's certainly a hot button issue for everybody at the moment. I'd also argue that things like gray leaf spot um, are probably a bigger issue for us year to year than what Southern is. Southern has been a big issue the last three, but I, I think gray leaf spot is something we need to be concerned about as well. So there's three. What are some other? What are some other things that give us yield losses on corn? Lack of water. Boy, we're going through that right now, aren't we? Two weeks ago, we were on we looked like we were gonna have a beautiful, beautiful corn crop and probably break a state record. Um, things have changed in that last week. Yes, water is a big one. In fact, water is the biggest. We can do everything else right management-wise and we go three weeks dry this time of the year and we're cooked. On the other hand, we can make a few mistakes along the way and if we've got adequate, timely water, we can, we can come out being okay in that deal. So what else? Lack of water is a good one. Uh, let, me, let me be clear, you get to eat lunch either way. <laughs> okay. All right. Not enough fertilizer. Maybe not enough fertilizer. That can be one. Not enough of a nutrient, something that limits a nutrient. What about weeds? 
He just came from the pest management side, right? What about weeds? Come on. So there are a lot of other things out there that can, be to, that can uh, cause problems and give us some yield hits. So I want you to keep that in mind as we're going to go through this. Okay, so what gives us high yield? I'm going to start right there with the water issue because that is the number one key issue. If you look at our statewide average yields year in and year out, I can tell you how much rain we had in July and August based on what our corn yield looks like on that statewide average. I can get a pretty good idea of where we were in that process. I'll say this, uh, I'll skip to irrigation for a second and we'll come back to the deep soils. But for irrigation, last year at Lexington, at Spindletop Farm, that research site, we were above average rainfall in July and August at the farm. We were doing an irrigation study there and we irrigated during that time frame and we gained 20 bushels to the acre with the irrigation event. So we were above average for total rainfall, but the issue was a lot of those rainfalls came within like a 24 hour period. Big heavy rainfalls, that doesn't help us out very much. And if you go back, you know, a year or two later and you're like, well, we had plenty of rain during July and August, you should have been fine. But the issue was, is we had some periods in there that we still went dry, even with those totals. Okay, deep, well-drained soils. A little harder to do if you don't have it already, right? It's a little harder to bring a dump truck in and, and get, get that. But I want to I want to talk about that for a moment because it is important. So the soil we're on right now has roughly three feet or so of, of rooting depth and water holding capacity, maybe a little bit deeper than that. But at three feet, about how many inches of water is that three feet going to hold at field capacity on a silt loam soil like this? Okay, it'd be about six inches, about six inches of water. Okay. Right now, this corn is burning through about a quarter inch of water a day. About a quarter inch of water a day. So how many days does that give us that we can go without rainfall? Maybe three weeks, okay. Maybe three weeks in there. And that assumes we don't hit 90 degrees, 95 degrees, and then that water use goes even higher yet, <laughs> all right? So that's roughly what they've got. How many inches of water does it take to grow a corn crop on average for a season for this part of the country? So you guys are being really interactive. I appreciate the feedback. This is, this is 30 is a little bit high, but it's 20 to 25, somewhere in that ballpark. If it's a really, really hot year, then we need 30, somewhere in that range. You get further south of us and 30 is what they need. All right, so we need 20 to 25 inches. We've just said we can hold six, so that's a portion. That's a portion. Now you get to a soil that's 10 foot deep, it can hold 20 inches of water at fuel capacity. If the roots can get down to it and use all of that, now what kind of buffer do they have versus us, right? So if we go dry for three weeks, we're gonna suffer, but somebody that has that real deep soil could make it on through. And so that's where that's critical, that's why that's why central Iowa, northern Illinois, places like that have consistently high yields because they've got very, very deep soils. They've got a massive, massive buffer against dry weather. All right, everybody with me? Everybody with me? So I realize that one's not easy to do if you don't have it already. And I've given this talk a handful of times. And I've had some farmers that have told me they're really mad at their ancestors for selling where they settled after, after looking at this particular slide. I can't help with that either. Um, I'm in the same boat as everybody else in that, that regard. Okay, some things that we have done when we've gotten those yields up above 300 bushels. In this case, there's been times we've used fungicides, there's been times we haven't. Okay, so we've gotten 300 bushels with fungicides, we've gotten it without. In those situations, we've scouted and tried to spray. Now, last year we didn't do it right. I made a comment earlier about southern rust in one of our fields. We, we made a decision not to spray, and in hindsight, we should have. So we also guessed wrong, or, or made the wrong, the wrong uh, suggestion. Now, insecticide, so far, we've not used those. That doesn't mean that insecticides aren't important. It just means we've not used them because we've not had insect pressure at threshold levels. Now, there's some fields this year around the state where we've had Japanese beetles that are high enough that that would probably warrant an insecticide application. Okay, but so far in our studies, we've not seen that. And then you see sulfur and boron on here. I say not yet. We've been studying that. If you get a 300 bushel corn crop that's 
30 to 40 pounds of sulfur that's probably being removed in the grain, something in that regard. And so we've been testing sulfur rates at about those levels to figure out whether or not we need that for an irrigated field. And so far, we've not gotten consistent results. Consistent with, every now and then we've got a yield increase, but it's not been consistent. It's not been repeatable. So we're not comfortable yet saying that you need to have a sulfur, but we're looking at it. And boron, we've just not, so far we've not seen anything with boron yet on the soils that we've been testing. Um, boron's critical right there at seed set when you get for pollination and initial seed set. Um, a lot of times when we, when we go dry during pollination, yeah, the dry weather is part of the issue, but we may, we may be disrupting boron flow at that point in time as well. But so far, these two have not worked for us yet. That doesn't mean that they won't, and that doesn't mean in some areas where they, they may not be of benefit. The vast majority of studies we've done where we've gotten to that 300 bushel crop, we've been above 40,000 plants per acre in those studies. A lot of those have been above 45. Okay, there's only been one time so far in our studies, and this was last year, one time that we got above 300 bushels per acre under this population. Now, if you look at yield contest data, there's been a few yield contest winners that have been under this level and been over that 300 bushel range. But for our research and our plots, we've always been above this number. Now, we've also done one of two things. Either we've had very timely rainfall. How often does that occur in Kentucky? Or Tennessee or this region? Very timely rainfall. We had it one year. Well, we had that one year, that once in 20 year, we had that one year where we didn't irrigate and we, we did well. But everything else we've been irrigating, we've been adding water too, okay? If you're at these kind of populations and you get short on water, the system will completely break down on you. You're looking at under 100 bushels per acre because this is way, way too high of a population if water is limiting, okay? And then kernel size, kernels per ear. We're looking at between five to 600 kernels per ear. So not massively big ears necessarily uh, in this. And so this is the point in the conversation where I'm gonna let a couple folks tune out for me and do some counting. All right. Good catch. Okay, you all count those up here and I'll, I'll, I'll keep talking for a moment. But so, again, this is what's, I'm not suggesting this is what we have to do. I'm just telling you this is what's worked for us when we've been up in those high yields. Adequate N, P, and K. And so if you're looking at the crop removal rate, what the kernel pulls off on average at 300 bushels per acre on average is 210 pounds of nitrogen. On average, it's about 120 pounds of phosphorus and about 105 pounds of potassium. Some of our numbers, some of Julia's numbers are a little bit lower than this for the nitrogen amount. We get into some really, really high populations and high yields, and we're not pulling off quite as much nitrogen per kernel as what this average would suggest. That's, a, that's something for us to continue to study and try to figure out. But those are these, these are ballpark numbers. These are basically the minimum amounts that we need out there if you wanna look at it that way in terms of what we're trying to support to make that crop get to those kind of yield levels. I mentioned this adequate N, P, and K. So far, in studies where we've had multiple nitrogen rates to test out what the different rates would do with an irrigated field. So in, in irrigated fields, everybody say it with me, with irrigated fields, one more time. Irrigated, well, that was terrible. Irrigated? irrigated? Irrigated, okay. Well, we've got water out there. Water is not part of our equation in terms of a risk at this point. In those scenarios, now we've also done a split application. So we're doing this over three different timings getting up to this nitrogen rate. 225 pounds of N per acre for our studies is where economically we're about topping out with what we do and we're not seeing on occasion, we're seeing some yield increases above this, but we're not paying for it at all, okay? So we had one study we messed up. I miscommunicated with the farmer. I put nitrogen on the study. They put nitrogen on the study. Our low end rate in that particular study was 300 pounds per acre, and the high was up over 450. Now we got 358 bushels out of it, so we could, 
we could kind of brag on that, that yeah, we beat that 350 bushel barrier. But when you put the economics to it, our best end rate was the lowest one we tested in that study. So all that extra in, we didn't pay for anything with that. Okay, now here's the other thing that's a kicker. This particular studies that we we did, this rate was our best end rate at 30,000 plants per acre, at 40,000, at 50,000, and at 60,000 plants per acre. So at every population we tested, that was our best end rate. And what was interesting was in those studies, about 42 to 45,000 was our best population. And that was regardless of which end rate we tested. Okay, so now why is that interesting? Why is that important? How many farmers right now are doing variable rate in and variable rate population in fields? Most, most are, right? And there's some logic to why we would be doing that and looking at that. This is a limited bit of data, but this limited bit of data from just a handful of hybrids tells us we may need to look at that issue some more. And in fact, when we go to these really high populations and push, it may not be nitrogen as much as it is potassium that we've got to go back and chase uh, to try to understand and learn a little more about. How am I doing on time? Six minutes. Man, I'm, I'm cranking. All right. So I'm going to leave, I'm going to set that down here for a moment. What do we get for the ear counts, kernel counts? 784? 720? 720? Somewhere around 820? Okay. All right. So those ears are too big. Okay. Based on, based on what we we're seeing in our data, those ears are too big. What other thing? Oops. How many of you, and we'll see it here. Now, the edge of the field, don't worry about this. Edge of the field, you'll see multiple ears on the edge of the field. You got more sunlight. If you've got adequate fertility out there, you're gonna get a multiple ear look. Don't worry about that. But in the middle of the field, if you see one of these, what does that mean? Not a thick enough population. That means you had some stress, whether it was population or something else, that the plant said, I can do more than just, just this single ear. I'll try to do another one over here. And most of the time, when you see a second ear, that means you've given up some yield potential. So in an ideal situation, you'd want a single ear per plant throughout that field in an ideal situation. If you see the second ear, that means the crop is trying to pick up and try to compensate a little bit for some, something, whether it's a low population or something else that, um, that allowed that second ear to go ahead and form.